Hey everyone, my name is Charlie Schrem. A lot of you know me from the Bitcoin forums and from the general older like hacker communities as Yankee. I got the nickname because I was like the only American at the time, or at least the only American that people knew of. Um, and that name kind of stuck, I liked it, blah, blah, blah. Um, a lot of you know me also as the, the co-founder and the CEO of BitInstant. And I'm also the vice chairman of the Bitcoin Foundation, which put on this conference here, which is amazing. Actually, the foundation board members just sat in a room or no to everything, and Lindsay was the one who really did all the work. So is Lindsay here? I want to give a round of applause. I don't know. Is she here? Hey, whatever. Lindsay, we love you. Um, the point of this, this presentation was set up to be cash deposits, challenges, and ideas. And there are a lot of challenges. Because in the outset, when you try to, Hello? When you try to describe Bitcoin to someone, um, what Bitcoin is is essentially cash with wings. You're taking something like the credit card, right? The credit card, wire transfers, ACH payments, every form of digital way or a way to send money, even checks over the world and over history, except for cash, except for fiat, is traceable. Every single credit card transaction you do, Big Brother can see. Um, and that's it's a problem for a lot of people, not for anonymity, but for privacy. Most of us go into a store, can go to a store like 7-Eleven, what's up with this mic? And, you know, buy a pack of and knowing that if we pay cash, then it's a, it's a transaction that no one can see. It's a, it's a private transaction. Um, and you don't know, when you have a dollar in your hands, you don't know what that dollar was, was used before. I've heard a statistic that like 90% of $100 bills have traces of cocaine on it, but I don't know how true that is. Um, so you, when you have something like Bitcoin, what, what really happened here, and that's what scares a lot, of, a lot of people, like regulators, which we'll get into in a, in a second, is that it's essentially cash with wings. So you're taking that local 7-Eleven um, um, payment for a pack of gum or a cup of coffee, and you're giving that ability to do a worldwide transfer. It's like if you have your cash and they have some wings on it. But at the same time, Bitcoin is not inherently anonymous, and that's a very, very big common misconception. And unfortunately, it's a lot of the things I have to start describing to people. It's like, oh, Bitcoin is anonymous. No, it's not. Just like everything else, there are the abilities for it to be anonymous. Um, and everyone was like, why? No, this is a great microphone. Is it good? Testing one, two, three. This one works too. I'll use both because I like to move around a little bit. Oh, all right, so. Um, so I lost my train of thought, I think, but we'll just pick up from wherever. Um, and that's what uh, an issue that I had found explaining Bitcoin to people was that they assume that it's this anonymous currency that's used by drug dealers and terrorists, blah, blah, blah. Um, but a lot of us know that's not true. And a lot, of us are, a lot of us that are sitting in this room have startups and have companies that are trying to take Bitcoin and take it mainstream. Because why? What is Bitcoin on the highest level? Bitcoin is two things. Bitcoin is the largest um, global payment infrastructure that the world has ever seen. You're talking about a, a, a payment system that has no central authority that you need to trust. There's no central visa transaction server. I remember um, a few months ago, I read a story that in Canada, this, the central visa transaction server went down for like a day for a powder outage. And that meant that anyone using a visa credit card in Canada can't use their visa cards for that day. And you're talking about people who have debit cards and credit cards that rely on it, like myself. I don't carry cash. Like, why? Why do, you, why do we have that issue? Why is there some central location that um, can cause these problems. So Bitcoin solved that problem is that when you have the decentralized database spread all over the world um, and it served kind of served that purpose when you have this global payment system. But at the same time, Bitcoin is also um, this unit of value and this unit of value that can be transferred uh, and has a price and trades on exchanges. And really, um, the reason Bitcoin attracts so many people because not only is it this amazing payment system and it's this, this currency that's out of the hands of any government or corporation, but it attracts a lot of people who believe in Austrian economics. And I graduated from um, college with a degree in, in Keynesian economics, which I didn't even know Austrian economics existed at the time until after I had graduated. And then someone gave me like these books. I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. 
not spending money to save the economy, really? That can work? Because you're taught that, that the way economics needs to work is that you need to, to, to be really, really, really involved in a local economy. Government needs to be super involved. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not a super on the right and all over the place. I think that there is involvement and there needs to be some sort of involvement by um, more like a, a consumer protection bureau type of entity that to pr protect consumers because at the end of the day you want to go to a website or a store and make sure they're not going to come and scam you which is another problem bitcoin solves because if that happens with one bitcoin transaction and we saw that with a lot of these bitcoin fly by night sites is that as soon as one person gets screwed over these sites can't handle it anymore and they have to shut down because people don't trust them anymore let me change over mics and that was um a great, a great reason, one of the great reasons that I got into Bitcoin is that I saw this super, super raw infrastructure of a payment system that I said, wow, wow, people are going and they're, they're uh, let's just take a Filipino nurse, for example. She is coming here from, from the Philippines. She's making $100 a week and she's trying to send most of that home to her family. And she goes to Western Union and having to pay 9, 10% for that. And the family has to wait like three days for that to happen. Doesn't make sense to me. Um, you look at something like being able to do micropayments on the internet. You know, when you go to Wall Street Journal now, or you go to a lot of like Financial Times, um, they have this concept of a paywall where you have to pay like $12 a month just to read one article. But who wants to do that? Who wants to pay $12 just to read one article? You want to read this article now. You want that instant satisfaction. Imagine if it said, send a Satoshi or send 0.01 Bitcoins. Most people would do that. I look at things like like flat, what Flatter tried to do with micro -dona of donations. Um, you have a guy on YouTube and he's putting his song up and he has no uh, record contract. Imagine the ability from worldwide, not just America, not just Europe, not just the UK, worldwide currency that anyone can be involved in. And it's really such a beautiful thing. So I said, wow, wow, this, this Bitcoin thing is crazy. And everyone laughed at me. When I first started BitInstant, um, I had to get money from my mother because I was left out of every venture capital um, firm in Manhattan. Um, no one understood what Bitcoin was. I didn't understand what Bitcoin was. This was like three years ago. Um, and I literally said, Mom, I love this idea. I put all my money into it, and we're growing so quickly. I need more money. And she wrote me a check that day. Didn't even, still doesn't understand what we do till today. And I, it's very hard to explain it to her, but I'm going to get there. The day I can explain to my mother what Bitcoin is in one sentence will be the day that I think Bitcoin has reached the mainstream. And we're getting so close. We're getting, I, I never thought that a year, a year ago that we'd be sitting in this room having a conference with over 1,100 people registered. It's insane. I mean, Bitcoin is already, you can walk in anywhere in, in the world, in California, in New York, or in Europe, and ask someone, have you heard of Bitcoin thing? And more often than not, people will say yes. And it's, it's crazy because it's really getting that, just even if they don't understand what it is, getting the word the, into someone's head is super important. So why cash? Um, when we started BitInstant, we wanted a way for people to be able to buy Bitcoin super, super easy. Um, and there's a lot of challenges, in, especially in regulatory environment with that. Uh, and a lot of exchanges went the route of doing ACH. Um, for example, a lot of you know what happened with the, the Douala Trade Hill uh, issue is that they were doing ACH into it. And because Bitcoins are inherently irreversible, it's a push payment, that when you do something like an ACH transfer where you have 90 days to pull it back and you can't pull back the Bitcoins, it's very easy to get screwed over. So cash is the only real way, the only real method of payment besides for Bitcoin that's, that's actually irreversible. So I said, all right, let's tap into this network. Let's tap into the ability for people who have cash in their pockets, who get their paycheck and want to be able to buy Bitcoin and send it to anywhere in the world and truly make the concept of cash with wings possible. If I can take that into one company, BitInstant, and make it that if you have cash in your pocket now, within an hour, your family in Russia can have cash in their pocket, then I've succeeded. And what we can do is use Bitcoin as our back-end settlement system for that meaning that instead of using wire transfers, I can use Bitcoin to pay my payment partners all over the world large amounts of money safely and securely at 2 in the morning. There was um, a story where someone needed, uh, I forget, I think it was a kidney, a kidney transplant in China at like emergency on a weekend, and they needed to pay the hospital 
Um, and it's true, hospitals won't operate on you until you pay them. I got 13 stitches in my hand in Mexico, and I was literally swiping my credit card on the operating table. Not even kidding. So, and they ended up what, what, how this person had a lot of money in America, but no money in China. The hospital wouldn't have gotten the wire transfer until Wednesday. So what this person did was they found someone in China willing to front the money if they had gotten Bitcoin. So the person in America sent Bitcoin about, I think it was 30 something thousand dollars to this person in China. And the person in China was waiting in the hospital, handed the hospital a check, and the, the patient was operated on. And that just shows you one really amazing utility of Bitcoin is that you have this crazy infrastructure. So with cash, the problem with cash is that everyone is afraid of cash in large amounts. No one wants to accept a suitcase full of, of cash, although it sounds appealing and everything. Try walking to a bank and depositing more than $10,000. They flip out at you. They make you sign forms and there's liability and there's, there's all of this because I don't blame them. You have a lot of um, problems today with things like terrorism, money laundering, where you'll see, you'll see whoever needs to use these new technologies the most are going to be the first ones to use it. That's why Silk Road really took off in the beginning of Bitcoin is because you had, you had a lot of like negative attention on Bitcoin and you had a lot of positive attention on Bitcoin. And when it was so new, I guess the drug dealer said, wow, this is like an amazing product. We're being pushed out of the banking networks. They're getting really, really compliant. Let's move over to this new thing called Bitcoin. And that's how Bitcoin became this huge wild west. And this was two years ago. And it was super scary because a lot are saying, wow, Bitcoin is drug dealers, it's, it's illicit activity, it's money laundering, it's mafia, it's all this. But the true believers, the guys like you guys sitting here today, and the people who started startups, really saw the true value in Bitcoin and its infrastructure and what Satoshi built. Satoshi built this amazing product and then he disappeared. And I think that he, I, I don't know why he would have disappeared, but some reasons I like to think is that he wanted Bitcoin to grow organically and he wanted us to really grow it ourselves. And Bitcoin is ours, it's not his. Even if he came back, there's no, there's no control he can take over. There's no control over Bitcoin, just like the foundation. There are five board seats that make these decisions, but at the same time, in two years from now, there's gonna be an election and all the five board seats will be replaced. The Bitcoin foundation, just like Bitcoin itself, was built in a way that it's fully autonomous and it's run by people. And I'm hesitant to say Bitcoin is the people's currency because I'll be called a communist, you know, and, I, and I've said that in places, so it's not, but it, it is in a way because it takes the power of fiscal and monetary policy out of the hands of the government and back in the hands of the people. But that's not to say that it's all free and clear. You have to know your customer. I'm going to say it again. You have to know your customer. Any startup, any Bitcoin company, anyone doing anything in the Bitcoin space, you have to know your customer. It's a very, very big problem when you have someone trying to start a Bitcoin company and saying, you know what, I'm just gonna not care. I'm just gonna let anyone use my system and have a nice day. You can't do that because if you're gonna be operating a company in the United States, and if you're gonna have employees, if you're gonna be paying them health benefits, if you're gonna be paying them salaries, if you're gonna be running and operating a real company, you have to be compliant in that country. Whether or not you agree with the laws or not, you gotta follow them or you gotta leave, or you can change them. And you can work really, really hard on changing them. And that's one of the things the foundation is trying to do, is to say like, you look at the money transmission laws. We live in the United, the United States of America, but for some reason, if you wanna start any payments company, you need to go to 48 different regulatory agencies in 48 states and register pretty much the same type of application in each one. Why? And it's been tried over and over again to uniform the money transmission law, but it's extremely difficult because I guess there are a bunch of reasons, but the states want to be able to make bank off of it. Um, they want to be able to enforce it themselves. State sovereignty is really important. There's the whole libertarian mindset part of it, but who really knows? All I know is that America is a place of innovation, and the more regulation we put on it, the more regulation we put on it, the worse it's going to get, and we're just going to push people out. So I think Bitcoin working together with, with different companies, with banks, with payment systems can do really, really great, amazing things. I think that Bitcoin in places like Africa and the Middle East can really harness amazing, amazing technology. Um, so there are a lot of challenges when it comes to regulatory stuff with KYC. You have to know your customer. Um, but at the same time, the whole term of anti-money laundering was a, a bank-invented term. 
Um, and really, I like to use KYC, know your customer a lot better, because it doesn't sound like it's like a criminal. When you open up a bank account or do anything financial related, I, I personally feel like, and a lot of people I speak to feel like, you're treated like a criminal on the outset. And you're having to like prove yourself. And in America, it's supposed to be, I think it's supposed to be innocent, innocent until proven guilty. Um, but when you get audited with things like the IRS, it's more like guilty until proven innocent. And that's when, that's how the whole financial regulation took hold over that. Um, any questions so far? So bit instant right now, we do basic OFAC, of course. You have to, we have to check your names against the Office of Foreign Assets and Control. And we've built a three-tiered KYC system, which says that, look, if you don't want to trust us with your social security number, that's fine. We can't give you, we can't put you on such high limits yet. If you don't want to give us your ID, that's okay too. We can't put you on high limits yet. But we still need to ask you basic information. We'll start you off with a $500 a day limit, start you off with a $1,000 a day limit, it's more of like, you trust us, we trust you type of situation. And that was kind of frowned on. A lot of regulators frowned on that um, with me. But I said, it's going to work. And it, it has been working so far. Uh, really excited to see that work. Great question. Um, and that's some of, so those are some of the challenges. But in terms of the future and ideas, you have something like cash, and cash has seen many different forms going back thousands of years. And you take a case study, if you look at Africa now, um, cell phone credit. Cell phone credit is cash. It's treated like money over there. Um, and you need, you need the ability to be able to connect these local networks, like M-Pesa in Africa, like the dollar like we have here in the US, um, like whatever currencies are used all over the world, you have people of local currency. If you have that ability to connect it uniformly, you can really create this like global currency. Um, and not just Bitcoin like traded between people, but if someone is, gives me cash here, I can use Bitcoin as more of a, a backend settlement to be able to move our money around the world and connect all these payment networks. And that's another thing uh, Ripple is trying to do. And, and I think Ripple is extremely complementary to Bitcoin in that it has this really, really good infrastructure to it. It's still a little complicated. I'm trying to understand it. But it's a value transfer system, as I understand it best. And I'm going to see where that goes. But Bitcoin inherently is, is a protocol, just like voice over IP or email. Um, and I hate, when, I hate when people tell me, oh, Bitcoin was hacked. Really? I sent them an article how $45 million was stolen from an ATM machine last week. The dollar was hacked, I tell them. Really? It's not that complicated to understand how Bitcoin works. So sure, there's a learning curve, but if you really try at it, you can understand it pretty well. Um, and just like anything important in the world, you don't need to understand the intricacies of how the internet works to be able to know what the internet does or how email works um, and things like that. Any questions? Just shout it out if you got anything. Ah, great question. So in the beginning, right now with BitInstant, uh, the question he asked, what happened with Trust Cash? In the beginning with BitInstant, we had a um, system where you can walk into any bank, a Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, or Citibank, and actually deposit cash in one of our accounts. And we're using the Trust Cash software platform to do that to um, be able to buy Bitcoin. Um, and the banks at first, they gave us their permission, but it was a little shaky. And then one day, they said no more. And that was it. They shut us down. I had no notice. I just got an email saying, sorry, it's all over. And we had to scramble. Thankfully, I met uh, some great people over at ZipZap. And they had built this network where you can buy, where you can essentially um, use the registers of places like 7-Eleven, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens. And we partnered up with them um, exclusively and set up a system that we work together hand in hand with them, that you can walk into any 7-Eleven, Walmart, CVS, Dwayne Reed, Walgreens, Albertsons, and buy Bitcoin at these locations. And we're going all over the world. We're going to the UK, we're going to Australia, we're going to, we're already in Russia, we're going to South America, we're already in Brazil now. You can buy Bitcoin at any of our locations, um, at any bank or post office in Brazil. And by doing so, if we're connecting all of these locations, connecting all of these countries in the world, 
a cash transaction in Brazil is just like a cash transaction in the United States. Um, and that's what we're trying to do at the same time. So you customer has Bitcoin, you just look at it like this. Someone comes up to us and says, I'd like to be able to send money home to my family in Russia. And I say, okay, great. Go to BitInstant, buy $500 worth of Bitcoin. They do for a low fee. And they send the Bitcoins over to their family member in Russia. They can go to a Russian location and cash out. And what they did was, instead of relying on one company to go all the way, they kept the Bitcoins themselves. The fees were a lot lower. Um, and it took only about an hour to do so, even less if you wanted to. So you're connecting all of these kind of um, global locations through Bitcoin. And that, I think, is something that needs to be explored. Global remittance is one thing that Bitcoin can, be, can do really, really well. So you have um, people say, like, well, what can I spend Bitcoin with? Where can I go? And now you can really go anywhere. You can use gift and buy any gift card with that, thanks to the BitPay guys. Um, you can buy Reddit Gold. You can use WordPress. You can go to, you know, um, thousands of stores. I have a bar in New York City called Ever. You can come in and, and pay for your drinks and, and Bitcoin, buy some bottles if you want to. Um, you can really do so many things with Bitcoin now. It's truly, truly crazy. But more importantly, why a lot of us got into Bitcoin is not for like where you can spend it, is that what you can do with it. What does Bitcoin provide as a, as a utility and what makes it actually valuable? Because what, what makes Bitcoin valuable? Who can answer that question? What makes Bitcoin valuable? Community is very important. Um, but what's up? No one can take it away from you is also important. All of these things you're naming are all utilities of Bitcoin. They're, they're the reasons that Bitcoin is valuable, but it's also this global payment infrastructure. Uh, and if you, it's interesting because I've been quoted saying this a lot of times, but I think Bitcoin is the largest, and correct me if I'm wrong, socioeconomic experiment the world has ever seen. Because what happened is with Bitcoin is you have all of these people like us around the world, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, that are saying, we agree that this data, that this thing, whatever it is, this asset, is worth what it says it's worth, $115, $125. And that's crazy because what is fiat? Fiat, our, the dollars in our pocket, why is it worth money? Um, it has no utility. It, it, it's not backed by gold or anything. Um, there are two reasons that I can think of off the bat is that one, we think it's backed by the full credibility of the United States government, which is, which is a lot, there are a lot of truth to that, GDP and things like that. But more importantly, you know that if you buy a bagel for a dollar today, you can go into the store tomorrow with that same dollar and buy a bagel tomorrow for the same price. So you're not going to go and try to get rid of your dollars and it's not going to cause a huge massive like bank run or anything like that. There is this like consistent economy in America that you know will be there tomorrow, hopefully be there tomorrow. Um, and Bitcoin said, that's really good. That's a, an amazing thing. But we want to go even further. We want to take this community, this infrastructure, this system of sending money around the world and make it into um, not only just like this payment network, but also a unit of value that people can hold, that people can, can buy, invest, speculate if they want to, use it as a college fund for their family 100 years from now. Um, there are a lot of different ways that Bitcoin can really, can really, really show its value. It's really uh, such an amazing thing. But at the end of the day, we still have a, a big uphill battle. Um, a lot of you heard Cameron and Tyler's uh, presentation last night, and they had a great quote that I think super implies here really, really well. First they laugh at, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And that's interesting because three years ago when I got into Bitcoin, there were, no one really was involved. It was a very small group of people. It was very new, kind of tech, geeky. There wasn't much infrastructure developed with it yet. And I had thought we were at like the laughing stage. Boy, was I wrong. I was totally wrong. We are just getting like from the ignoring into the laughing stage now. And the laughing stage is not people saying, ha, 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 this is stupid. The laughing stage is the naysayers. The laughing stage is people saying, um, wow, this thing is scary. This thing is, has potential disruption. And this thing could be crazy. And, you know, you look at banks, government entities, regulators, um, inherently good um, people that 
have a lot to lose if Bitcoin succeeds. And they're, they're going to be the ones who are laughing at us at first. And then we get into the scary stage. The scary stage is the fighting stage. And that's what we're going to see um, regulatory bodies come down hard on, compliant, on uncompliant companies. That's why I say you've got to know your customer. Look what happened with, with, um, with um, Mt. Gox. It's, it's, it's scary. But at the same time, I know personally that Mt. Gox does extreme, extreme KYC. I mean, a lot of us here know that it takes three weeks just to get your Mt. Gox account verified. And if you try to go to mtgox.com and, and buy Bitcoins using a VPN or Tor, they automatically lock your account. So I know Mt. Gox is trying, but then being a Japanese company and trying to work with U.S. customers, it's a lot harder. So I said, great, we're going to start BitInstant, and we're going to be the shining city on the hill. We're going to be that company that succeeded in the United States, work with governments, um, work with banks, did compliance. Um, and as of yesterday, we became an agent of a, of a licensed money transmitter. So that's just an, in 30 states. So that's just another step ahead. And that's very difficult to do because um, there are only like a handful of companies, like 20 or 30, that actually have licenses in every single state, all 50 states. And um, a, few, a few weeks ago, FinCEN came out with their guidance saying, like, what is Bitcoin? And they were just kind of, which actually was a lot less clarifying than, than it actually caused a lot more confusion than, than it should have. But it's important. It's important that that happened for a few reasons, because it showed us that um, they are, it's on their radar, they see it, and they're not inherently going to just come after it hard. They may try to regulate it and tax it, which could be good for us. It's, it remains to be, a lot of it remains to be seen. We don't know. Every day in Bitcoin is a new day. We don't know. But a lot of it's remained to be seen. So that when that FinCEN guidance came out, it said that Bitcoin, um, people that hold Bitcoin, they're okay. I'm not going to jail. Bitcoin person to person, it's cool. But at the same time, companies like mine operating in the space need to be super careful on who they accept Bitcoin from, where they send their Bitcoin, who they're moving money around from. And even so, they said that Bitcoin companies are money service businesses that need to register with FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network of the IRS. But also they said that um, Bitcoin companies are money transmitters. Now, in that, in that um, guidance, that doesn't mean anything. Money transmitter is states. The states regulate this concept of a money transmitter. But what FinCEN did here was clever because they essentially gave the states a free pass and said, all right, we're telling you that this Bitcoin thing is a money transmitter already. So now a state needs to just come out and say, all right, Bitcoin is money transmitter according to the federal government. Every Bitcoin company that's operating the state needs to have a money transmission license. And it's very, 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 very hard. I mean, some, some states require you to put up like a $5 million bond. Um, you need to have like fingerprints, um, go through rigorous, rigorous background checking all of you guys and all of your employees. It's crazy. That's what I'm saying. It's like there's so much, um, and a lot of it's from, from consumer, it's consumer protection. I, I see that. But there's so much regulation that it's, I feel like it's pushing down innovation. So one thing that needs to happen is, look, this money transmitter law should be pretty good. But at the same time, we should make it uniform. We should make it one one application that you need to fill out and one time do all this fingerprinting. You know how many times my fingers were pricked from, from all of these applications I was filling out? Um, and that's where, that's where that's going to go. The regulatory is really, really important. We can't ignore it. A lot of Bitcoin companies at the beginning tried to ignore it and got shut down. And they got shut down. Either the bank accounts got shut down or the regulators came at them or they got killed for fraud. There are a lot of different reasons, but you got to be really, really careful. Um, and then I sat down with Gavin um, in Austria two years ago, and I said, Gavin, you have this crazy wild west of this Bitcoin space. Everyone out here knows Gavin, lead core developer. Um, and I said, Gavin, we need to start, we need, there needs to be some sort of like foundation or a way that we can kind of pool our resources together as small companies, work together, be a lobby group, work together for advertising campaigns, mainstream Bitcoin, watch each other's backs. Because at the same time, we can all be competition, but all my competitors and I, we're, we're really good friends. In the public, we maintain that we're like enemies and we fight, but privately, we all work together. We extend each other credit, we, we, if one of us needs float or extra Bitcoins, we'll, we'll help each other out. Um, we give each other advice. We all work together. And so we said, let's start this foundation. Let's, let's figure out a way to kind of work together. 
and we got together with Peter V and a few others, John Matonis, and that's how the Bitcoin Foundation came, uh, came into play. And the first order of business was during this conference, and I think it is an overwhelming success. I'm super happy with, with the turnout of it. And thank you guys, everyone, for coming. Um, what time is it? Okay, I need to wrap this up. I could just ramble on for hours. Are there any questions? Just shout them out. Great question. So this is the thing. So, okay, he asked, where do you see exchanges in five years? I am not a fan of all of you guys buying on exchanges. And I'm not saying that because I want you to buy from BitInstant. But exchanges shouldn't be the place that I send my mother to to buy Bitcoins. It's complicated. What the hell is a trade order? What's a limit order? I'm Googling it. I have no idea. I'm not from a financial background. This is how I see it. Exchanges are wholesale. Companies like mine, Coinbase, others, we are retail. We should be servicing the guys who are buying under $10,000 worth of Bitcoins because there's a whole, the over $10,000 and the other ten, under $10,000 customer, it's a totally different animal. When you have over $10,000, you need to fill out CTRs, SARs, do crazy things. Under $10,000, it's a little more lenient. So I think that if companies can, exchanges can focus on that aspect and work with, um, you work with um, uh, small companies like us, we can do really well. So you look at us now, Mt. Gox, we, BitInstant buys a large amount of Mt. Gox's Bitcoins every day. And we buy from Trade Hill. Um, we buy from a lot of different, Bitstamp. Bitstamp is a really good exchange. We buy from all these different exchanges. But we are that customer. But you are that customer too. You come to us and you say you want to buy Bitcoins. We buy in bulk and we sell it to you for the same price and we make money on transaction fees. So the exchanges are like our distributors, our liquidity providers, people who want to off and onload large amounts of Bitcoin. And if the exchanges focus on that specifically and can really drive into that and, and service the VIP customer, they'll do really well. And that's one thing I think Trade Hill is trying to do. They're trying to go after just the accredited investor only. And, and I, let's see how that goes. The exchanges, one reason why Mt. Gox is, is, not, um, is not doing so well because besides for the, so their trading engine is, needs to scale up is that it's very difficult for them to handle clearing of dollars and, and euros and pounds, being an exchange, being the under $10,000 exchange, doing customer service, regulatory. They have their hands everywhere. They have, and they have a huge team of people. Like everyone assumes that it's just Mark and like two staff members. They're like 20 people if you ever go to there. And they have a nice Japanese office too. So they're working hard, but their, their hands are everywhere. So exchanges really need to focus on these specific things. I'll focus on retail. So you guys can walk into a Walmart and buy Bitcoin and that the exchanges focuses on wholesale. Any more questions? Because we have to finish up here. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I really enjoyed it. Have a great day.